The time has finally come. Decades of waiting across millions of fans, those let down from the live action movie years back, and those who picked up Mario since the mid 80s, over 30 years later, the official Super Mario Bros. movie has finally came out. I am a channel dubbed Mario, I adore the Mario franchise, and parts of this review will be looked at with a more non-biased lens, the lens of someone either not a huge Mario fan, very casual or not that big on Mario, or those just not connected with the brand in any capacity, but to set the tone from here on out, and let you know all parts will be unbiased, oh, oh. Plenty will be the opposite. Ooh, I am a huge Mario fan who's played a wide number of Mario games and likes a lot of them. Between the news of the film's production, then Illumination taking the mantle, but it's gonna be fully animated, then the cast, then the trailer setting the stage for the movie, just a wild roller coaster of processing, emotions and such. And a roller coaster is how I describe this movie as well, as a guy who's grown up with Mario for around 20 of his currently 24 years, because I enjoyed this movie very much. I thought it was just pure unadulterated fun from start to finish. I would not stop smiling the entire time. Four times, four I have seen this movie, and even with plenty of the flaws the movie does have I'll go over as we go, I still love and adore this movie so much. The way I see it, this movie is primarily going to gear to two specific demographics for the most part. The first is people like me and most of you watching, crazy obsessed weirdo nerd Mario fans. If you're connected to the games in any capacity, or even just one of the games like Donkey Kong or Super Mario Brothers or Super Mario Brothers 3, any Mario Kart game, like any of the games and even just one of them, you're going to like this movie. It's a movie that is a bona fide love letter to Mario fans and more than just the numerous easter eggs and references telling you either subtly or blatantly look at this specific game this specific thing comes from and the other demographic is general family audiences families kids parents even it's a solid and fun family film it's a good kids movie if you're a family that grew on nintendo your kids like mario you're not going to go wrong with this movie at all Families will enjoy this movie and find some value in entertainment. It's a movie made for Mario fans and made for general audiences, whether families or your average Joe, even with minimal to no attachment to the Mario series. And whether you do have or don't have an attachment to Mario, this film definitely aids, like some recent modern gaming adaptations, in showing the immense value and love when it embraces it's a video game adaptation through and through. There is zero doubt in my mind, everyone working on this film was an immense labor of love to the franchise. It's a movie with Tons of passion, care, and love for the Mario franchise. It's a Mario film that looks very Mario, feels very Mario, follows a lot of Mario rules, conventions, mechanics, and such, topped with it being fully animated to blend it all together. It's unapologetic in both how it's a Mario movie and that it's a video game movie. Definitely one of, if not the most unapologetic adaptations in that regard. And between that and so many different points on this movie, I have a lot to talk about. So a portion of this review, much later, we'll dive into spoiler stuff. I'll throw that sign up when we get to that point, but more or less, one half non-spoilers, other half spoilers, I don't think it's half and half, but spoilers, much later, we'll get to that point, I'll let you know. And spoilers means anything not shown in the recent trailers or commercials before the movie's release. And I would have liked to put more into this review than just picture slideshows, but Universal and YouTube's copyright system are in an abusive relationship alongside time and specific skills for something I don't have at the moment I'm trying to work up towards, you'll see in the future. So there is a very strong chance, years down the road, I revisit and re-review this movie for the channel with some of those ideas I have in mind. This will likely not be my only review for this movie in the long distant future. Otherwise, I've seen this movie not three, but four times. It's not perfect by any means, but I do have a lot to say. So let's talk about the Super Mario Brothers movie. So funny story, trying to watch this movie. I've been hyping up how I've been trying to organize seeing this with a bunch of friends, some family members, some bringing their friends and their boyfriends and girlfriends and whatnot, just making this a huge event. More than 40 people. I had so many friends and people ready to gather up April 7th, the original perceived date of the film before they bumped it up two days, months of planning, schedules aligning and whatnot. I've been adamant on trying to make it work since the first or second trailer. By the time I get to the theater, there's a main water pipe leakage that the fire department had to get involved that forced the whole theater to shut down. 
there was a plumbing problem at the theater the same time and day we're all going to see a Mario movie. The IP where the two main brothers are plumbers and they shut down as we get there. I'm decked out in one of those blue Mario tuxedos some other YouTubers wear where it's, it's base, it's blue, but it's just a lot of Mario characters plastered all over the thing. And I got this cappy hat waiting on the rest of the party to get here. And I basically had to let them know it was a bust just trying to make it this massive personal event with family and friends. So many people it not working out at the moment it counted that was such a massive bummer half of us stuck around at least we vacated to a different theater in a different spot surprisingly we had enough seats so i still got to see it with plenty of friends just not all the people originally planned not as big as the whole special occasion as i wanted to make it out to be but still got to see it with more or less 20 of my friends was still very fun and the theater was pretty packed didn't give up Salvage what we could of the situation, and I can assure you, the first time we saw this movie, we were Marvel fans, basically. You know the kind. Those that like to cheer whenever a character's on screen, characters fight or do a thing, the whole audience erupts, and all this clapping and applause and whatnot. I can assure you, the catalyst for half the pop-offs in that theater was me, dude. Like, when, when Mario and Luigi show up the first time, I'm legit the first guy shouting, Let's go! And the whole theater claps. When Bowser pops in, people clap. There was, like, legit every main character's intro got applause. We were, all, we were all the exact parallel to Marvel fans. We were those moviegoers. We were those kinds of people in the theater. But now I get the hype for why Marvel fans do it. And I am so there for this new generation of Nintendo movies to do more Mario and other Nintendo movies to where we could just keep doing that for every movie they pump out. I'm there for that, dude. <laughs> but I think the first thing I could start off actually talking about the movie now probably the lead up and slight production tidbits of the movie as well as the overall setup slash premise for it this project has been in such a long development period since 2017 for planning and production beginning in 2018 and the idea wasn't immediately optimistic given the live action mario movie labeled as the worst game adaptation and one of the worst films ever by millions of people paired with illumination being the studio making it and in spite of how well their movies do their track record as far as quality is far from the best either they go on record stating they don't want to put in too much money into their movies the films themselves having a lot of family and especially kid pandering tons of cringy jokes pop culture stuff generally unfunny boring choppily paced etc their minions movies despicable me sequels secret life of pets sing etc the vast sum of their projects being the lowest common denominator for hollywood films as blatant soulless cash grabs for a lot of people and nintendo mainly me Miyamoto's track record being strict with Mario or not a fan of injecting more narratives into his works and whatnot, which <clears throat> not true. Did a lot of research on that in another video. I can guarantee you, nope, that's definitely not the case. And the other major worry of just how could you adapt Mario into a film? How could you attach a story to a Mario movie? It's kind of funny when Miyamoto confirmed in a recent interview too that this took so long for Nintendo to do a movie because of the precedent the live action Mario movie set being a remarkably unfaithful adaptation and just a bad movie in general and millions always speculated that was why we never got a Mario or more video game movies up until this last generation and we've had several games mainly the RPGs but a couple others beyond those that do give Mario and other characters a deeper, narratively denser story with deeper lore and whatnot, but most Mario games don't do that, especially the mainline games. You just have Mario save Peach, save the princess from Bowser, and that's it. That's basically the story for most main Mario games. How do you make that work in the context of a film story-wise? Personally speaking, with videos backing this up, I was cautiously optimistic, I was a little bit open, that they could adapt Mario into a film adequately enough. I had some hope at the start, at least a little more than most people, but I wasn't immediately sure like everyone else. You not only have the RPGs, but a couple other Mario games too, with a deeper narrative surrounding the plot itself. But with a lot of anxiety and eyes on this project and Nintendo's usual quality control with most of their major, biggest projects, especially Mario, 
studio, they definitely would not want to repeat the failures of the live action movie and drop the ball on their own accord this time all over again. They need to make this a competent enough adaptation with not even just enough references and whatnot to the games, but also enough material to sustain a decent enough story, a decent enough narrative surrounding the film, while still feeling like Mario. And I'd say it basically worked. The movie, story or theme-wise, does not do anything groundbreaking or new. If I had a criticism for this film without going too deep into it yet, it's that all on its own, as just a movie, flat out. It definitely does not do anything different from other movies that you have not seen before. The message, the overall theme, the writing and characterizations, etc. In the overall broad sense that it's a film within an industry of thousands of others. There's far more fun and excitement to be had if you're a Mario fan to some length, but if not, I wouldn't expect anything too crazy or revolutionary narrative-wise. But it has its vision of what it wants to be, just a fun Mario movie crafted by those that love Mario. You got a lot of Mario stuff. Power-ups, floating blocks, the kingdoms and islands, set pieces, music, platforming. This movie is literally just as much Mario as the games. The feel, the cartoony nature of it all, the colors, the logic, everything about this movie screams. It is a passionate, heartfelt homage to the Mario universe, and it really shows throughout this movie in a very passionate and fun way. Again, not a groundbreaking venture by any means, but it's an entertaining and fun movie in general and that's all I need to call it a good movie. However, to an extent, I can understand why critics were panning the Mario movie early on based on this. It doesn't do anything crazy as a movie, but it's hard in most cases to expect anything decently grand or revolutionary, primarily and especially story-wise, when Mario's involved. It's Mario. You can't really expect anything too crazy story-wise, because we're talking Mario at the end of it. That and a couple critics' reactions were... A lot more on the unhinged side, plus when you remember Cuties was rated 87 by critics on Rotten Tomatoes, so you can't always take any or every critic's words at face value with a lot of media in general, nor should you use most of that to validate your own opinion on a piece of media, or whether to check it out or not. Same applies for this entire review. All of that is for you to decide, and that's what matters at the end of it. Outside of that, Illumination's track record always left a lot of skepticism in this movie's wake and coming out of it, purely comparing to their other films, I'm pretty sure most can agree this movie's up on their higher end of better to decent or good movies. For some, maybe their best film, which I hold that opinion to, but that's not saying a lot because it's Illumination, let's be honest here, lowest common denominator, and this is coming from a big Mario fanboy. So, a lot of my thoughts, the good, bad, and mixed, are largely coming from a place of a hardcore Mario fanatic, who's adept on the Mario franchise and most of its lore and world building and whatnot, alongside how it stands as a piece of Mario media in the general grand scheme. I feel people are underselling it and or the overall narrative of the film a little bit, but we'll get to that later. Otherwise, I don't blame you if you're not a huge fan of Mario at all, and you felt the story and general narrative was lacking, or that the movie itself doesn't have anything new or major to tell or teach to most audiences that other great, greater, better films haven't before. It doesn't. And that's definitely one of the movie's weaknesses, if not the biggest. The casting for the film always left such a fun, wild reaction from everyone who saw. Like, just the cast almost no one could have pieced together and said, yeah, he'd be perfect for Mario or Toad, Bowser, Peach, etc. Chris Pratt as Mario, that was the main one a lot of were not looking forward to. I was open to the idea if we saw more of Chris Pratio, I was a believer. I figured, eh, he might be fun, he might be good, I don't know, people might be being a little bit too hard on him, and everyone else with the other characters, most people were either optimistic towards or completely on board. On Chris Pratt as Mario, I personally feel he does do a good job, and most are more or less in rough agreement. In the trailers, they opted for outtakes. Lines not used at all or worser versions of the lines recorded. Trailers for movies do that all the time, and I figure that especially come the second trailer. Mario is also written as your average guy living in a big world in Brooklyn, so he leans somewhat into that Italian accent, but he has most of that Brooklyn inflection, the Brooklyn accent, and I thought he managed in a satisfactory way, like I predicted. It, it was fine. I enjoyed it. He served this version of Mario pretty well. I thought it was good. 
Charlie Day, for all I know, did his regular voice as Luigi, but I think this was one of the castings that fit the most. Charlie Day's Luigi was very great and entertaining. Keegan-Michael Key's Toad was also pretty great. Anya Taylor-Joy's Peach is not the same high-pitched, hyper-feminine voice Peach usually has, but I enjoyed it thoroughly a good amount all the same. Seth Rogen's Donkey Kong, surprisingly very fun, even when that's basically in the same camp as how I felt with Charlie's Luigi, just basically his normal voice, but I thought it was pretty fun, and Jack Black's Bowser makes for an extremely good Bowser, probably the strongest actor, but everyone pretty much thought that since the first trailer. Capturing that perfect balance of Bowser, intimidating, threatening, but also wacky and goofy. Kevin Michael Richardson's Kamek was great as well, Sebastian Maniscalco's Spike was solid, and Fred Armisen's Cranky Kong was fine. Along the lines of Chris Pratt personally, maybe like a decent bit worse. Plenty of voice work I'll touch on again here and there when we get to the characters, but overall, across the main cast, the voice acting was pretty good. It ranges from fine enough to fantastic depending on the actor. The guys who played Luigi, Donkey Kong, and Bowser voice-wise are the strongest performances in this film, and there are two characters Charles Martinet voices in the movie. They're not huge roles by any means, but I'm not saying who those characters are here. yet. Not even just his performance as those characters, also the roles he fills are literally genius. So well done and clever in why and how they did it. It's so good. And just the general atmosphere and vibe of the whole thing was pure bliss. If any video game series deserved a good adaptation, if there was one series that could prove you can make for a great video game adaptation, Mario is 100% the series to do it. Amongst the sea of adaptations where we have The Last of Us Show, Cyberpunk Edge Runners, Detective Pikachu, the Sonic movies, etc., now the Mario movie is basically another solid, good video game adaptation. And take this with a grain of salt because I have not seen The Last of Us Show, but I hear a lot of high praise for that and its writing and faithfulness. But the Mario movie feels the most faithful to the source material and the proudest in doing so out of a lot of other adaptations. Again, you go into this movie with even just one Mario game you played in your life, you'll likely enjoy the movie well enough and see that game referenced in the movie. One of this movie's strongest suits, probably its strongest, it's its immense, immense authenticity. Veteran or newcomer to the Mario world, this is about as Mario as you're gonna get. Very cartoony, a lot of platforming and power-ups involved, legitimate power-ups and stuff from the games in every way you could think of, 2D Mario, 3D Mario, Mario Kart even, the characters carrying the adventure and interactions and story, the wacky, mystical feeling, a lot of what you would expect and feel playing a Mario game is in this movie. Other game adaptations in some way, whether making it live action, adding a whole different character, plot line, etc. that's completely disconnected from the source material, have felt to some degree that it's noticeable and does impact the experience, hampering the overall quality or intent of the movie as a proper adaptation of the game it's based on. With this Mario movie, it feels completely aware of the brand it's adapting from and 100% chooses to embrace everything it has and what it's about in every way. Albeit a stretch, kind of, that's the only way I feel like you could argue in some way this movie does something new or stands out from the others. It gives a shit about both adapting its source material, but also pulling zero punches or compromises on delivering that, being authentic and respectful to that source material in every conceivable way. This movie's entire atmosphere, look, logic, power-ups, writing, etc. The entire Mario movie is remarkably comparable to the Mario games in a lot of ways, even beyond the slew of references and easter eggs, and that's definitely one of the strongest traits this movie has, just in how faithful and voluminous it is in embracing the entire Mario ethos in a 90 minute film, and that alone is really surreal. Even seeing these characters not even just adapted in a hyper-realistic CGI way that still mimics the cartoony nature and feel of the games, just the surrealness that after 38 years, for me 20, I'm sitting in these theaters with friends and hundreds of other people watching this and thinking, damn, I'm sitting down in a theater and watching an actual legitimate Mario movie with other Mario fans of all kinds of generations. How baller is that? Topped with the thousands of nods and easter eggs and everything the movie does, seeing all the Mario stuff I grew up with adequately put in this film, just a very heartwarming feeling. It makes you feel a little fuzzy inside. Plus, like, yeah, Detective Pikachu and Sonic 2 do have some faithfulness to the source material, and those are still good movies. Sonic 2 is still a good movie that has not changed. They're good game movies and examples like the Mario movie. But the Mario movie, once again, it literally goes all the way. 
all the way. It really took decades, all this time, for Mario to show if you make a movie like 90 plus percent faithful to the source material, you're bound for easy success and an easy way to please the fans of that brand as well as attracting newer audiences. You don't need live-action hybrids or weird fiction cross to the real world shenanigans mashing or vague nods here and there. No, you can make an animated movie with writing and structure that mimics and respects the game it's based on to the extreme, and it can be good. Speaking of the hyper-realistic CGI and design, if there's one thing every single person can agree on, it's how the movie looks. The presentation is unbelievably sublime. This is an incredibly beautiful movie. The colors, the visual details, the landscapes, character models, the sound design as well, but in general the animation and expression on display, it's a beautiful movie to listen to and watch, even to just get lost in the colors and animation, regardless of how much Mario you know. There was a lot of love and care put into the visuals for the movie, and the animation especially. Every major and minor character is incredibly expressive, they emote very vividly, it's extremely extremely polished animation and visual quality. The Mario series is a brand that just is getting more and more emoteful and charismatic in its expression the more media we get, and I love it. Peach is super expressive, same for the Mario Brothers, it's a definite marvel animation wise for Mario fans like us. This is the most expressive we've gotten these characters, and I am so there for it 24-7, 365 on repeat for decades. Now, I kind of skimmed this around the start of the review, but the base plot's basically what we saw in the trailers. Mario and Luigi get separated, Luigi lands in the Dark Lands by Bowser's Domain and gets captured while Mario lands in the Mushroom Kingdom. Mario's eager to do whatever it takes to save his brother and stop Bowser to do such, and has to save the Mushroom Kingdom and the world in the process. If you wanted a skinny spark notes cuff of the plot, that basically is it. Obviously there's more, every main character involved has a personality, motivations, Mario is an arc, the interactions across everyone as well, like, all of that is also the story, or at least the overarching narrative surrounding it, but that is your standard fare with movies in general. Not with Mario, Mario games and most adventures aren't story heavy and attract people more from their gameplay, but that's the bare minimum for most movies, so once again in a broader sense if you're not attached to Mario, that definitely can lose your interest and enjoyment, when the general story follows basically the same thread line as most of the main games. You just swap Peach out for Luigi. For Mario enthusiasts though, there is more to it beyond that, that while I agree with the base plot being kinda standard, it's also underselling everything else if you know Mario. But here's where I start getting into the whole Mario fanboy fanaticism of it all, cause once again, that kind of character exploration or deeper narrative is not the form for Mario. That's usually in the RPGs, and even then we don't get a lot of that on the core Mario cast, especially Mario himself, because one of my favorite things about this movie are the characters and the characterization in general. In my opinion, Everyone's character is basically either on point or characterized in a way that's either entertaining and or makes sense within the context of the film or even the broader Mario world. So Mario's written as a small guy in a big world, he has big dreams, but is constantly being met with various hurdles and obstacles whether related to that or his quest to save Luigi in the Mushroom Kingdom. He's built to be relatable, sympathetic, but also adaptable, willing to take risks if he needs or wants, determined, stubborn, unwilling to give up constantly pushing through to make sure he meets his desired goal. It mirrors a lot like his characteristics are in numerous Mario games, as well as the player growing up and playing through those numerous Mario games. His personality is written to parallel the theme and appeal of what makes Mario games so popular and replayable. Chef's kiss to that, but also a chef's kiss to my Mario & Luigi character arc analysis video. A lot of that video is aging like fine wine. One of a couple Mario movie videos I made, aging like fine wine really, but Mario is characterized as all of that in a way that still allows a ton of people to relate to Mario still, even in movie form. And that's not all the movie does to ensure that, but that gets into spoiler territory as I'll go deeper then. Also, Mario's adorable as shit. He's so cute. Look how pudgy his face is. Look at his cheeks. Luigi's character is done justice in large part because it basically is exactly like how he is in the games. Luigi's Mansion, Mario RPGs, Galaxy, etc. Loving to his brother, kind, gentle, but he's more timid, 
cowardly, he doesn't want to take risks like Mario does, and the movie does give time to emphasize both bros have this close brotherly bond that is what binds them towards each other throughout the movie and balances out their personalities. Bowser is the exact same case as Luigi's characterization being 100% parallel, and I know he's definitely a lot of people's favorite character in this movie. He's up there for me too. The movie strikes that strong balance of this scary, threatening, monstrous side of Bowser that grants him the villainous boss title, but he also has some insecurity and comical short sights, but none of that comedy and goofiness Bowser has takes away from how scary, terrifying, and how much of a brute he actually is, which is the best kind of Bowser we see in the RPGs and a couple other Mario games. Jack Black manages to capture both elements of Bowser extremely well, and the more Nintendo sticks to this portrayal of Bowser, the more Mario games are going to be entertaining, definitely one of my favorite characters and most parts with him in it. Kamek is a solid and funny supporting role for Bowser, the Blue Koopa General is a suffice satisfactory obstacle for Mario and the others, Toad is a solid side character, he brings a good enough blend of comedy and assistance to Mario and Peach when he's on screen, and he does stand out at least a little bit from the other Toads of the Kingdom. I love Donkey Kong in this film, they made him a frat boy. <laughs> he's basically a frat boy. <laughs> he's one of those high school jock douchebags and like, come on. It's perfect for Donkey Kong, especially as an obstacle slash rival to Mario in this film, and when he's supposed to be the heir of the leader of the DK crew. Donkey Kong was one of my favorite parts and characters in this movie. I love what they did with him, his character, his dynamic with Mario. Donkey Kong is really fun in this movie. Cranky Kong is probably the weakest part about this movie all around in either characterization and writing. I think what he does is fine, it gets the job done, but the other characters stand out much more. Voice-wise, it was fine. I definitely sensed the voice leaned more on Krusty than Cranky, if you guys get it. But a lot of Cranky Kong in this movie basically serves what he's meant to do. His role, his voice, it's fine. It's whatever. But, I gotta give Peach a whole section to this review, and I'm glad most of the Peach stuff is stuff we've seen in the trailers, so most of this doesn't count for spoilers. We all knew this going into the movie from the trailers, because low-key, I think my favorite part parts, character, and just favorite thing in general was Princess Peach in this movie. Basically everything they do with her and everything surrounding her, I love what they do with Peach in this film. Peach was fire, bro, on top of being such a baddie. Ooh. Character-wise, it felt like Whiplash with how capable and skilled in general it was, but it did feel like a breath of fresh air. Now there are games, Mario games, like Super Mario Bros. 2, Super Mario 3D World, Super Princess Peach. Mario plus Rabbit's Kingdom Battle and Sparks of Hope, Super Paper Mario, to lesser extent, Paper Mario and Paper Mario the Thousand Year Door, even lesser, Mario and Luigi Bowser's Inside Story. Point is, there are half a dozen Mario adventures that have Peach take on a proactive, more direct, and major role far beyond being the damsel in distress, rather being just as much of an asset as Mario in being another platforming hero. In particular, since the second trailer, the Super Mario Adventure comics have been the best comparison with Peach I felt. Peach in the film is basically the same Peach from those comics, I'm a fan of that. But on the whole, this kind of Peach portrayal isn't really anything new, but it's definitely not exactly the norm. For the longest time, literally since Mario 1, who are the characters people label as the most generic, cookie cutter, and uninteresting? Mario's one of them, but Peach especially. Always labeled the damsel, always getting kidnapped, almost every 2D game, 3D game, most of the RPGs, literally for decades, decades, millions of both hardcore and casual Mario fans chastising Peach for not fighting back, amounting to nothing beyond a romantic end goal for Mario, and tons upon tons wishing she did more in Mario games and Mario Adventures, despite the several games that do give Peach a stronger, more involved role alongside Mario. And now, this movie basically delivers that, which is cool, but executes her in a way that makes a lot of sense. This is Mario's first trip to the Mushroom Kingdom. He's a complete fish out of water to this world and what you're supposed to do. Of course, Peach will be the one the most equipped in teaching him platform is kind of the norm here, to maneuver around certain structures or to dodge and take out some of Bowser's army. You have to jump, wall jump, long jump, run and understand all kinds of traps, obstacles, enemies, etc. And Peach is the literal leader of the land where a lot of that is common, so from her status as the ruler, forget another branch that's a spoiler I'll get to later, her being a pseudo-mentor for Mario showing him how much he needs to learn platforming and power-ups and such makes a lot of sense, and as a representation of the advanced Mario player. 
Mario being the fish out of water, an experienced novice, and all of this emphasizes how he is the young, inexperienced, mistake-ridden Mario player we all were growing up way back when. Peach is basically the Mario player that understands and has already mastered the tech, the game. She knows what to do, has seen these types of obstacles numerous times, and knows how to effectively platform and maneuver around and through them, and that's a genius way of adapting Peach into a dependable ally, alongside other examples we'll get later, by basically showing she understands the lands she's trying to rule, while also giving the audience and Mario fans that thematic parallel of novice versus veteran Mario players that bounces off Mario's whole character arc, and the entire appeal of the Mario franchise. It's so smart and so beautiful. She's just like me for real, and how I'm now a guy who's competent, good at most Mario games, especially the 3D ones. And even how she clears the obstacle course also felt like watching someone play Mario too. She's wall jumping, long jumping, triple jumping kind of, she does maneuvers you can do in the 3D Mario games. She clears the course really fast too, it's like watching someone speed run a Mario game. The entire obstacle course bit was one of my favorite parts of the entire movie, easy, because of so many parallels to the Mario games across their core appeal, and the journey Mario fans go through with his games reflected via Peach and Mario, as well as how it all plays in to Peach's strengths and character as well as Mario's for the film. Anticipated or not, it was just a fun sequence, and Peach to me is so fun in this movie. I wish we got more of a Peach like this in the games. She's not as hyper feminine or bubbly compared to her games, you can 100% call that a flaw since it's not completely faithful to her portrayal in most Mario games. But there's nothing wrong with making her more serious and capable when she was in several games, plus a comic series, when it fits her role as the princess of the kingdom that grew up there, and when for the longest time, most wanted her to do that and be that anyways. Even then, not a lot, but there are pockets of her being bubbly and happy and all that here and there in the movie again. Not really a lot of that, but I genuinely had no problems with Peach in this movie and thought a lot of her screen time was some of the most fun I've had with this movie. I'll talk more on Luigi in the spoiler section, but on top of all of this, it also makes sense why he is the damsel in all of this, with Peach assisting Mario's platforming and Mushroom Kingdom knowledge in all of this. Her not being a damsel is unlike most games, but if she was here, Mario would literally have no no palpable reason to go after her beyond his initial attraction to her. We all know he has romantic feelings for Peach in the games, but this movie's meant as an origin of it all, and it tries to establish Mario and Peach's actual connection as friends, and her showing him the stuff from the games basically helps set that bond in motion. Luigi's no stranger to being a damsel to save as Mario either, but Mario's little brother being kidnapped by a genocidal monster like Bowser inherently gives Mario the motivation to go through all of this off the bat already. You make Peach the damsel in all of this, you risk making Mario look significantly shallower than he actually is, and hardly anyone watching would believe he's risking all of this time, energy, and his life for a woman he either just met or hasn't met up until that point. Now, whenever sequel films make Peach a damsel, he has that connection to Peach already thanks to this movie, and adding that to all the other creative and clever ways of incorporating Peach and her role in this story, I was so involved with everything her and Mario did the entire time. Any of that woke, anti-woke, political garbage is always such a non-issue critics and people want to bring up whenever movies try to make women or non-white people do more involved or important stuff that shows them being capable or efficient. It's different cases with some movies here and there, but dog, we're talking a Mario movie. It's basically a kid's movie. I guarantee you this is not some political trash some people are trying to make with this Peach being a girl boss equals her in the Mario movie is woke, yet this movie outperformed Disney films so it's anti-woke, woke equals bad, anti-woke, bad, whatever. Peach being a capable asset like she was in several other Mario media, most being several other games like I listed, where she would have to know how all of that platforming and power-up usage works, given she rules the exact land where all of that knowledge is very common, and especially to have her and Mario reflect all the Mario fans that grew up with and are just getting into the franchise, I promise you, it is not that manipulative political propaganda when it's a Mario movie trying to be fun with that fact. I find it really hard to believe those were trying to have fun with this movie if that's one of the quote unquote problems people had with the movie when there are other legitimate issues tied to the actual movie itself. Some I already went over and others I'll get to. 
but if labeling any specific thing with that woke, anti-woke BS, that has to be exhausting for no reason. It, it's a non-issue that got mainstream with the Star Wars sequel trilogy, but a lot of the logic labeling woke is bad will mark thousands of other films over several decades as woke, therefore political and or bad, including older Star Wars media, larger side tangent, bigger can of worms, I'm getting farther off track. Point is, Peach's entire execution in the Mario movie is one of the best things about it because a lot of it was incredibly fun and a lot of it was also smart and cool. Other characters will dive deeper into spoilers because there's stuff with them trailers didn't show, but they basically showed most of what the final movie did with Peach. Plus, movie Peach's design and overall look go so hard. I'm not the biggest Peach fan throughout my Mario journey. I always gravitated towards Rosalina most often, Pauline rivaled her come Odyssey, and I do like Daisy a lot too but Peach was never my immediate go-to Mario girl for me, you know? Coming out of the Mario movie, where she's the type of girl that could kick my ass and how expressive she is on top, the lips, the eyes, the hair, you know, I see it. Yeah, nah, I get it. I'll climb on board. It it's the looks, but it's also her being a fierce, capable leader. She was a baddie in the movie, bro. She was hot. Such a baddie, bro. But whether or not you add her, the characterization in general was really strong and something I think more people could probably appreciate or have more fun with than thus far. I loved everyone and their personality and characterization. And while Bowser and DK are standout for me personally, Peach was a refreshing highlight, and even then, they could probably stand to balance a bubblier, hyper feminine Peach with this fierce, cooler Peach, similar to Bowser's goofy yet threatening balance, but it was still good. What's also fun, the world building, how Mario and Luigi link up to the Mushroom Kingdom, how seamless and natural all the platforming is as well as the power-ups, how often they incorporate power-ups as well and utilize their effectiveness and the variety since there's a good chunk of power-up variety throughout the film, the fact the Mushroom Kingdom's its own land, Kong Island, Yoshi's Island, and the Penguin Kingdom and the Dark Lands, they're all distant countries, islands, landmarks making up a larger world here, and they all have their own distinct identity with actual communities and cultures, by Mario standards of course, but it all goes back to that authenticity, that maximum level of embracing the gaminess and Mario-ness of it all. The movie universe feels unironically thought out and genuinely cohesive, which is impressive especially when at least half of this entire world largely bases most of its conventions, visual design, and ideas from the mainline games, especially the 2D ones, more than anything else. There's more to it than just this mishmash of thousands of Mario easter eggs and references, which even that still has an insane amount of thought behind it. There's thought behind a lot of the world building and construction of the Mario world and the movie canon, but you can even say the exact same thing about all the references because there's literally thousands, thousands of nods to the games, outfits, Buildings, character cameos, signs, posters, enemies, platforming moves, cart parts, maneuvers done by Mario, Peach, and even Donkey Kong, sound effects and Kamex magic, and characters jumping and platforming across Mario 1, 3, World, New Super Mario Bros., etc. Sound clips used for a few characters ripped right from the games. The soundtrack especially has so much depth in both the composition and which Mario games are referenced there. Koji Kondo, Brian Tyler, they both composed music for it and confirmed at least 130 songs across the Mario series. On top of how seamless and effectively it's all composed. That is remarkably impressive. They were cooking with the movie's soundtrack. There's the obvious Mario 1 music where I'm pretty sure like every single piece of Mario music from the first Mario game is there. Power-ups, coins, level clears, etc. Several songs from Mario 3, Mario World, Mario 64, even Mario Galaxy, Mario Odyssey, Super Mario Kart, Mario Kart 8. I'll list more of the actual songs and spoilers, but man, the soundtrack for this movie, especially for Mario fans, is fantastic. There's a portion of that movie score we'll talk about in spoilers, albeit probably one of the least spoiler stuff, but you'll know when we get there. But even on the visual easter eggs, especially early on, there are even several different nods to a lot of old school NES IPs. Even a few IPs from years later used, but between that and how many ways they made these nods and the total easter eggs there are, it's always fun going back to this movie and rewatching it discovering new and more fun homages. The level of detail in what's referencing which Mario thing is objectively, astronomically huge. 
purely from the Easter egg hunt of it all alone, it's a perfect film for rewatchability or re even replayability. It's a constant theme park of several potpourris of Mario Easter eggs. Four watches later, as a seasoned Mario fan, I'm still discovering new stuff about this movie. Another criticism I 100% agree with regarding this movie though, without giving away too much yet, is also the pacing. But more personal, especially after rewatches, I'm definitely feeling more it's a double-edged sword than anything else. And even then, like most of my other critiques to the film, it's not a huge problem that ruins the movie to a major detriment in reality. But on the plus with the pacing, you're never going to be bored with this movie. There's always something happening, characters are always from one area to another, half the times there's action involved, whether platforming, fighting, carts, etc. It's a considerably fast-paced movie. And whether I watch a show or a movie that drags and slows its pacing, or such that is fast and always has something take place. Take it from the One Piece fan right here, fast paced any day of the week. That and what I'm adding on top of that is likely some complete tinfoil hat, hopium copium. But compared to the games further, Mario games also follow a similar pace too, whether the Mario Kart series or the 2D, 3D main games, Mario games are also fast paced too, especially if you're good at the games. Always a new obstacle or level, always stuff going on, new shortcuts, tech, objectives, moves to perform, etc. And a lot of this movie does feel like playing an actual Mario game as well. So in a sense of how authentic it is to Mario, the pacing isn't that far off from the game's general pacing either, which I do believe works on its own. However, that doesn't fully excuse what the movie could have extended further on, being further in depth and further exploring some characters and character moments. I do feel certain interactions between characters, ways the movie establishes characters' personalities slash motivations and arcs, Mario and DK's dynamic or Mario and Peach's for example, some of these guys' backstories too, they, they bring it up, establish the minimum, and kind of move on from there to the current event. Like they don't let some of what people want more out of these characters, their backgrounds and dynamics with one another breathe or simmer for just a little bit longer. You can tell or it at least feels like they had so much planned and idealized for the movie but they had to condense a good chunk of stuff and cut other stuff out to fit the 90 minute runtime. I don't think you need not even a whole 5 minute scene, like even just 1-3 to three extra lines in some of these interactions I think could go a long way with giving Giving more time to settle in these characters and what they're about more than what we got. Basically, even by just one to five minute tops, some scenes, some action, but primarily a good chunk of character stuff could have used more screen time and exploration. It would have added more to the story and remedied some of what people felt this movie could have done more with. What I think was also very effective was the action for the movie. I felt there was gonna be good action. There was some great stuff between Mario and DK's fight, the Mario Kart stuff, the obstacle course training. All the third act essentially, there's a lot of fun action that was thoroughly constructed and it's a fun time there too. Same for the writing and general comedy. Solid blend of slapstick and action with witty banter, personalities exuded from Mario, Luigi, Bowser, DK, Peach and more, and general dialogue being solid. None of that illumination, pee pee poo poo fart baby twerk Fortnite jokes, that's, that's kind of a plus on its own. You don't got any of that in the movie. But it's all normal, typical type of comedy you'd expect from a cartoon or most movies. But most of it gets the job done, and some of it here and there is pretty funny. And also, stay till the very end. post credit scene, there's two of them. One at the very end's the one where you're it's trying to allude to something. post credit scene in the middle, but mainly the very end. Stay till the very end. This movie encapsulates what Mario is and adapts it beautifully to the big screen. That and going to see the movie multiple times, I'm passing people by, kids with plushies, teens and adults dressed up with hats as some Mario characters, cosplaying as them, or just wearing Mario t-shirts and whatnot, casually chatting about Mario in general. It was surreal, but also just a warm feeling of knowing the immense reach and impact Mario has, especially in this day and age where, do not get me wrong, millions love and play Mario all the time, but we have so many games and franchises and companies now to where you could be either a casual or a hardcore gamer and not even touch a Mario game. Mario is still having this huge of a stamp on the public and pop culture in general, given this movie's insane success. The stamp itself being vastly bigger than it ever was in the 80s and 90s because Mario's gotten much more famous and bigger and is an 
unbelievably well-known multi-generational franchise, more so than Pokemon because Mario's been around for much longer. And this movie's still doing that and introducing so many younger people to Mario and bringing those older audiences back to Mario in a classic, nostalgic, yet new and refreshing way. It's all just such a cool and precious feeling. It'll be interesting to see how this movie ages down the road, particularly from two different branches. One branch is how they're going to answer everything this movie sets up and establishes, both pros and cons, with sequel films. Let's be 100% honest. We're getting multiple Mario movies out of this. I don't even think we're just going to get a sequel. An entire trilogy, bare minimum, I think they're going to make after this movie. I love to pretend we don't have a second post credit scene, or that scene alludes to absolutely nothing. Because pretend either scenario was the reality. Let's add Chris Melendondry also stating regarding a sequel, Oh, well, I'm not allowed to talk about that at the moment, and we hope to do more projects and things together, right? Let's pretend all that's true. There's a point I'm making. Look at all the records! This movie's breaking, bro. $70 million opening day, which for both a Wednesday and for animated films, that's very good. Biggest opening weekend for a video game film, an Illumination film, and an animated film, beating out Finding Dory, Incredibles 2, Frozen 2, and The Lion King remake in that regard for animated films. Despicable Me 2 was Illumination's highest opening before this, making over $377 million just in that first weekend. It's the biggest video game movie of all time, surpassing Warcraft in both of that, as well as the opening weekend performance hitting 400 million in not even the first week it's been out. It's surpassing the global box office within that first week plus then both Sonic movies, dethroning Ant-Man Quantumania in that regard in just a week. It's currently the biggest and highest grossing film of 2023. A little more than that to pass 5 million, half a billion dollars in just 10 days, still having the best second weekend, the momentum carrying over an entire week and a half, and three weeks since it came out. Already over 900 million. It's currently in the top 70 highest grossing films of all time. Top 20 for animated films. Has made more money than both Sonic 1 and 2 have made in its lifetime. Is the highest grossing Illumination movie domestically. A lot of these records for both films in general and especially animated films. Forget video game films are insanely huge. Half of these this film managed to achieve within the span of a single week. And it did all of this before it even came out in Japan. Before it came out in its own home country. This review will likely go up the day it comes out in Japan. Too bad it's already been six days since recording, you dumbass. Today's May 3rd. It already hit Japan. Yeah, it already passed one billion dollars last Friday, the day of for Japan. Crossing the top 20 highest domesticated grossing films in animation, the Mario movie casually achieving this when no other video game film prior even got halfway, when most animated films don't even get that far, all in the span of 24 days, less than one month. The Mario sleep! The Mario sleep is real! But the fact it's this close to a billion before that, it's basically right there, literally more than 90% before it's even out in its home country. That alone is Omega impressive. Through its theatrical run, it's projected to earn around $1.2 billion and through home release, DVDs, digital and whatnot, almost double that amount on top, $3.5 billion across the entire shebang, projected, but over $3 billion? Summary? It's succeeding in essentially the highest order possible for animated films and so many different records being broken. Why is this guy circle jerking all the numbers right now? Number one, I made a video literally saying this movie was going to be a massive hit, a massive phenomenon, more than two months before the movie even came out. Even then, I've basically said such at the very start since the first trailer. But I made that video... EVERYTHING! EVERYTHING in that video pristine fine wine right now. Everything I said in that video basically aged remarkably well. It's something I know for a fact was not a hot take in the grand scheme, but several people commenting on that video telling me, I'm stupid. 
I had expectations way too high. It was gonna make like 300, 400 million at best. I don't know how box office or domestic earnings and global earnings work. I don't know what I'm talking about. Me being a smooth brain dumbass of a Mario fanboy or whatever, but mmm, mmm, sure, sure, buddy. I don't know what I'm talking about, but ooh. Ooh, look at the records, it's smashing right now. Okay, maybe the movie breaking all these records in sales this fast is one thing. Understandable, have a nice day. But a Mario movie that already looked this promising, this faithful, this highly anticipated, only cutting roughly 100 to 400 million. If they were lucky at best, brother, look in the mirror, check the mirror, stare at yourself in the mirror, because it's not me, that's a dumb one. But like... We have always been talking about, in factoring of all brands, Super Mario. Mario. Super Mario. One of the largest, most recognized fictional brands out there. Nintendo's mass market. Gaming's Mickey Mouse. How are there people thinking the opposite was gonna happen? Like, the games and their numerous successes speak for themselves. The numbers have been there for almost 40 years. Come on, bro. Really? We've been talking Super Mario the entire time. That is an insanely popular franchise. It's bigger than DC and Superman. Like, if you're not gonna look this stuff up and verify yourselves, do not go off and say I don't know what I'm talking about when I've been looking stuff up like this for years, and when I've made researched videos with backed up sources referenced in them and their respective descriptions for years, especially if I'm talking about a franchise I literally named my channel after. If it's something I don't know enough to talk about, I'll bring it up. I'll say if I lack the proper knowledge or didn't sufficiently research enough. Pikmin in my Miyamoto video, for example. I'm not afraid to own up to stuff I feel I don't know enough about. But I know Mario's not bigger than Dragon Ball, Hello Kitty, several Disney properties, Pokemon, Star Wars, Call of Duty, etc. To not gaslight or lie about numbers like those, but I know my way around the block to estimate or hypothesize how much of a specific Mario thing will perform and why. This Mario movie, especially being one of those Mario things that was gonna blow up insanely hard. So that's number one. Number two, if we didn't have the post credit scene, or a scene alluding to anything major, even if we had zero rumors, even if Miyamoto didn't confirm there's no doubt more Nintendo movies will be in production after this, look at all those numbers and profit this movie's raking in. In just the first three weeks, or even the first two, or the first week, or even just opening weekend. Both Nintendo and Illumination are gonna want to make a sequel, even if they don't confirm it, or even when we have no rumors alluding to it at all, or not, we're getting a sequel. It's Mario, it's Nintendo's cash cow, Illumination's infamous for milking their own brands as well, we're gonna get a fully fleshed out Mario cinematic universe in a or multiple sequel films, it's just a matter of time. Third, it's a movie I enjoyed, and a Mario movie I think is a lot of fun. So it's not too hard to think why fans of a brand would celebrate if that brand's new thing is doing this well, especially if most people like it. That and this is my favorite franchise and it's breaking all these records. Raking in one more billion dollars, literal Mario sweep for its first legitimate theatrical film directly from its parent company. Look at my boy go. I'm happy for him, bro. That's my boy right there. That's my favorite franchise right there. Look at him go, brr, bro. Those are why those records and numbers are wild to take in, but those first two reasons especially are why we're inevitably gonna get another Mario movie at the bare, bare, bare minimum. Trilogy, I think, is the bare minimum, but a sequel? Oh, easy. Free. Easy, free. Totally happening. And before I go back to my point, Frozen 2 and The Lion King remake made 1.5 billion and 1.67 billion respectively in their runs and those two movies are the highest grossing animated movies of all time purely based on their theatrical runs do i think the mario movie will eclipse those numbers yes 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 i yes <laughs> yes it managed to even get nine tenths of the way to a billion in three weeks before it even came out in japan and south korea and we all know mario is huge in japan it's 100% at the very least, going to 10,000% reach the top 5 for the highest grossing animated films. Once this movie hits Japan, there's bound to be another surge, and it's definitely going to pass Minions for sure, and sneak into that top 5. It's going to be the highest Illumination film ever. Easy. 
Frozen 2 and mainly Lion King remake I think is a bit of a taller order, but again, this movie's momentum has been insanely strong and Japan's market for Mario is massive, not to mention South Korea is about to get it too. So I'm gonna predict it's gonna pass both of them. Top 5, top 3 for animated films, yeah, I think it's completely possible and the fact it took Mario to topple Disney, the same franchise where his creator expressed wanting to make him the next Mickey Mouse, despite he was already the equivalent of Mickey Mouse for the gaming industry, is really funny when you add this movie's insane success, Nintendo branching out with Super Nintendo World, the theme park business, and the Switch being one of the absolute biggest consoles of all time, more than the Wii, and both Nintendo and even just the Mario franchise, one or the other, they're so much more relevant now than either one has ever been, ever. In the, like literally ever. The theme parks are doing good, the Switch has consistently been an insane seller, still selling well, now this movie is going to bolster both of those on top of being one of the absolute biggest animated movies ever and even amongst some of the biggest films period. Insane. Absolutely wild how much Nintendo and Mario are rolling with this momentum and popularity right now. But back to the main topic, a lot of the flaws this movie has could potentially be rectified in a sequel film and they go the Star Wars route of giving us multiple sequels or spin-off content to flesh out the Mario cinematic universe and give us a branch of Mario lore the games don't really focus on much. This movie already drops several sequel baits already, several galaxy references, two different backstory stuff. Both post credit scenes, the concept of Pipes period, you also look at just everything the Mario series built up to this point because this movie objectively scratched only the surface of it all. We could get a longer film, we may get more story and character moments across the characters, more fleshed out backstories, more fleshed out personality exploration, a more layered, deeper plot, maybe we'll get a Donkey Kong Country movie or TV show, same for Luigi's Mansion, maybe a Mario cartoon down the line, a WarioWare or Wario Land cartoon. There's a lot of potential in both more Mario cinematic content, Mario cartoons and spin-off series, as well as such for DK, Wario, Yoshi and such as well. There's so much reason to do any of that, it'd be weird not to consider doing them at all. Donkey Kong Country and Luigi's Mansion spin-offs I could picture after this. This movie already broke the ice for Nintendo to consider more films of their other properties. I have no doubt Hollywood in general and multiple movie companies as well as gaming companies are now going to tackle dozens of more video game film adaptations to capture the Mario movie success. But a sequel Mario movie film, nay, multiple sequel Mario films are a definite inevitability. And how they tackle that will make this movie's retrospection interesting. And the second branch in how this movie will age is how well its entire theming and ethos matches Mario itself. For an average moviegoer, it'll probably range from a 6 to 7 out of 10, occasionally an 8, a C to B tier movie on how it is at that, but as a piece of Mario media, let alone a Mario movie, easy 9 to 10 out of 10 for a ton of people who are Mario fans. Hearing that reminds me a lot of how plenty of mainline and popular Mario games are received or critiqued in similar manners. A lot of this quality stuff is subjective, but I think a lot of us can agree for example, the new Super Mario Bros. series and games. They're good, they're fun, but they're not the craziest or peak of what the Mario series can offer. In difficulty, variety, creativity, scope, story especially, etc. Some might have DS or Wii as some of their favorite Mario games, but people may call Galaxy more of a peak Mario experience, or Odyssey, Mario 3. Mario World, the RPGs, etc. But my point is, even with this movie's flaws, the fast pacing, the underutilization, or lack of full utilization, I should say, of that backstory, character, and character dynamic exploration, and the movie itself not really having anything new or unique to tell as a movie within the industry, etc., those are likely the main issues the movie has. While they're not egregious, the strengths this movie has are very easy to sink into. It's an authentic and faithful Mario movie, it still has strong and entertaining characterization, there's always stuff happening, and fun or interesting stuff either being established or taking place, it has solid writing, solid comedy, great action, it's a gorgeous movie with stunning visuals and great character designs and animation, great sound design and music, it's littered with all kinds of easter eggs and references, and it genuinely is just a fun movie to sit back and watch if you even care a tiny bit about Mario at all. 
but that exactly can be said for the vast majority of Mario games, even those that aren't the best of Mario's adventures, whether we're talking a specific branch of Mario games, or the entire Mario franchise as a whole, or the entire video game industry, because I can attest to Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze being one of the best 2D platformers in that entire genre, better than every 2D Mario game in my opinion. A lot of its strengths and positive qualities match exactly the Mario games, alongside once again that ethos and core theme. Overcoming obstacles, that determination, stubbornness, not giving up, mastering the level, and control you have with these well-controlled and well-designed games, the constant fast-paced thrill of the adventure, and all these different events, places and stuff happening in the Mario world in multiple Mario games, the core appeal of what made Mario so fun and popular for such a long time across most of his titles, as well as the theme and message those games pass on to the players, is not just what I described, but it's also the exact same core of Mario's personality and character in the movie, as well as the core theme, message, and appeal of the movie itself. It's just as replayable and fun to play, just like a Mario game. At the very least, it'll be an interesting way as time passes in both on its own and how Nintendo will expand the MCU, Mario Cinematic Universe, but I think this movie will age very well, not because of necessarily its writing or message or traits being stand out by movie standards when most of them aren't at all, but it'll age well from thematically matching the exact same charm and appeal the games have managed to maintain and extend over the decades, and the movie does that so well in so many different and creative ways, as this review's gone over extensively. That that same longevity, that timelessness, will parallel in this movie, even when it's far from the most narratively complex, thematically rich, or masterfully crafted piece of cinema that'll shake the industry. The tens of thousands of easter eggs and references aid in that too, but this movie is definitely a lot more than that. It genuinely is just such a fun time that has that Mario magic the games have, and will be a movie most will feel an inclination to watch more than once for one reason like the easter eggs, or another in just its structure, its charm, the Mario-ness of it all, etc. And with how popular it's been the past three weeks thus far, I don't think I'm far off base to think a lot of its successes, traits, and appeals parallel the games in far more different ways and comparisons than most of us are led to believe. Thus leads us to the spoiler section of the review. So forewarning now, if you haven't seen the movie, get out, watch it, come back for this part, otherwise, skip to this timestamp to avoid spoiler talk. No going back in three, two, one, spoilers. So the movie starts off just like the first trailer did with Bowser raiding the Penguin Kingdom. Good segment as always, but another slight gripe I have that a lot of people have. Pop culture music, yeah, this movie does dip some toes in pop culture music like every movie. Take on me, I need a hero, yeah, there's that standard pop culture music. Weird enough, M Miyamoto also confirmed it's there because he felt having a movie without that kind of music would be odd, so they opted to add some in. Despite most people who saw the movie unanimously agree, they didn't want the pop culture music in the film. Especially when one of the appeals of the movie was one of the composers being the composer for the Mario games and a famous movie composer making Mario music for the movie. Literally, the pop culture music invades that. Some of those songs legit replaced some missed, unused movie score remixes you'll only hear on the soundtrack outside of the movie. Personally, that is the only L I got from the pop culture music. It wasn't a lot of it, and they were all meme songs. They were all meme songs. I'm a shit poster. I love my memes. There are also 80s songs too, Mario being an 80s icon on top, so I personally, I didn't mind the pop culture music that much, but I'd much rather have zero of it in the movie when the vast sum of that non-pop culture music was phenomenal, when it took away from songs we could have gotten in the movie, and when especially tons of other people beyond me, most people would much rather zero pop culture music in these kinds of films. It's a video game film. Literally, the, the whole appeal is just like, here's Mario music. It's like, I want Mario music. Don't take that away from me, bro. I, I care about that kind of thing. I am one of those weird nerds that cares about my Mario music. To add to that too, not necessarily a gripe or problem, but another interesting thing with this movie is some scenes, like the Cheap Cheap Bridge and Peach pulls a Cheap Cheap off of Mario's face, Scenes like that are shortened outright, like between that and the pacing in general, with some character stuff needing a smidge more fleshing out, 
I really gotta know if there's gonna be an extended cut of the movie at all. Like any extra or deleted scenes or whatever, a version released with the cut of the movie score, music that was replaced by the pop culture music. I don't know how common that is for animated films, but I feel like they could probably benefit from an extended cut of the movie with stuff like that in there. But it's that, Kamek making stairs for Bowser to get to the star is cool. I should have suspected the star was a superstar, just like the 2D games, where they make you invincible, and when a lot of this movie plays it closer to the 2D games than the 3D ones, I opted for the power stars more, but they could differentiate the two down the line in sequel movies. Still, that's done, then the Mario Brothers plumbing commercial plays, that's still a remarkable thing, the super show getting acknowledged and canonized in actual Mario media made by Nintendo. The full rap from the Super Show being remade, that is awesome. This commercial itself being this old, shoddy, amateur 90s-esque commercial, it's smart and charming. Then playing with the Italian accents, also clever and funny, and a great way to settle from the game bros' voice and accents to this movie's versions. It's clever, the Mario World nod with them wearing capes and laying on stools to pretend their flying's both funny and cute. And when you go out to them in Brooklyn, anytime you're in Brooklyn in this movie, Nintendo cameos out the wazoo. Holy moly, bro. There are several frames, pictures, posters, posters and doodads in Mario's room later on, street signs and whatnot that reference. Punch Out with Glass Joe and Little Mac and Doc Lewis, Duck Hunt, the polar bear from Ice Climber, Discoon, Balloon Fight, Game Watch, and R-Wing in Mario's room referencing Star Fox, an F-Zero poster. The pizzeria at the start of the movies named Punch-Out Pizzeria, right next door to Sunshine Travel Agency, Super Mario Sunshine. The couple that calls Luigi and Mario, Luigi's got a GameCube startup ringtone on his phone. They have a Pikmin statue in their home next to the husband reading a book titled Galaxy with Gateway Galaxy on the cover. Like literally all over the place are so many references and homages to several different Nintendo games and series alongside the hundreds for Mario in and outside Brooklyn. I also love how there's this guy, I think his name is Giuseppe, whose name is supposed to be a play on the word jump is playing what's basically Donkey Kong, but it's called Jumpman instead, and Donkey Kong's a Yeti in that game. And Giuseppe's design matching Mario or Jumpman's look from Donkey Kong, topped off by the fact he's voiced by Charles Martinet, voice of Mario in the games. This is a very clever way of both giving Charles a strong cameo since his voice is what molded Mario as a character since 64, casting him as basically Mario from the first game, and him interacting with movie Mario as a way to pass the torch to Chris Pratt. This was wholly clever and super charming. I'd be down if Giuseppe cameos in like every Mario movie from here on out, as long as Charles continues to voice Mario. Such a good role for him here. And funny enough, we get our introduction to the only other major character Nintendo teased during the marketing who was not marketed whatsoever until after the movie came out for whatever reason, the boss of Wrecking Crew, another classic Nintendo game, Spike. Sebastian Maniscalco's voice work is pretty good, but character and design wise, it's definitely not terribly close to the original artwork, so I was not expecting him to be this tall, brolic, snarky tough guy that's basically a douche. And I kinda dig it. Mario's ex-boss, being Keemstar, kinda works very well. The movie does good on setting him up as a jerk and Mario quitting his company to start their plumbing service. Mario and Luigi get a call for a leaky sink pipe, their trek through construction zones neat, how it's this 2D perspective like the games, Game & Watch sign present, also this alignment of crates and paint cans with the yellow fan above them, and the yellow sign with the 8 on the left, mimics the exact alignment of blocks in the first level of Super Mario Bros., as well as most of the new Super Mario Bros. games. Clever, cute. The 8 also looks like the 8 from Mario Kart 8, Mario sliding down the pole at the end's queue, and the burger joint next to it, literally looking like the castle at the end of every level in Mario 1. Very good. Very nice. So they get to the client's apartment, they do their thing, and the wife's dog causes a ruckus because Luigi stepped on its bone and broke it. It gets the job done to give hijinks to Mario and Luigi's plumbing job, but it definitely is the weakest part of the movie, I feel. This also reminds me of how Miyamoto said way back he had a poor encounter with a dog and that led to the concept and creation of the Chain Chomps in Mario, but I don't know if that's just a coincidence and this was just put in for an easy problem for them for the plumbing stuff. Plus, I, I, I do feel bad for Mario here. He, I unironically think he is good at plumbing. He got the job done, he knows where to look when Brooklyn floods later, the dog literally just screwed everything up. 
also like this little foreshadow here with Luigi pushing the mirror back against the water. So that becomes a bust. Fast forward to low key, one of the coolest, the most surreal things about this movie. They went and gave Mario and Luigi a whole ass family. A mother, father, other members. We all speculated and never got much glimpses into their family tree at all. And Nintendo went and scrounged up old unused character designs for family members and used them for this. And I think that's super cool and weird. It took us 38 years for us to see the bros have a family. Mario and Luigi have a mother and father. The latter also being voiced by Charles Martinet too. Another clever voice role. I also find it a wild coincidence too. Mario hates mushrooms. We see later on he gets used to them and he hates them less and less. It works, but movie Mario and movie Sonic both hate mushrooms. Wildest coincidence if I've ever seen one. But making Mario hates mushrooms until much later in the film, it's an interesting choice that I think works. So some of them make fun of the plumbing commercial and their plumbing stuff, the mom being supportive, the dad not approving though, feeling Mario's nuts for chasing his dream, leaving a steady job, dragging Luigi down with him, and this movie plays into Mario feeling small as he is a short manlet, but also people telling him he shouldn't do one thing or another, as we see some pushback similar to this from Peach, Cranky Kong, Donkey Kong, Bowser, etc., and like from Spike earlier on. I wish we got a little more on the family, whether his dad dislikes plumbing at all, if him or others in the family are good at plumbing or jumping, if the events of OG Donkey Kong transpired at all, or anything more than what we got. But this and Spike's interaction manages to set Mario's stubbornness and determination to set out to do whatever he wants to achieve, regardless of what others say, and to not quit. Just like the platforming stuff, just like the Mario games, but in ways that relate more to the audience. Also, of all the games, of all the games, Mario is playing out of frustration in his room. It was Kid Icarus. It was referenced on the plumbing site, but not only is Kid Icarus in a blockbuster movie, Kid Icarus is now a part of one of the biggest animated films ever and movies ever in general. As a massive Kid Icarus Uprising fan, that easter egg, in fact, is hell awesome, dude! Oh, hell yeah! Same goes for the Pauline cameo. She looks amazing. Obviously wish we got more of her, but at least she got a cameo. Could always explore how she became mayor, or again, whether they want to establish arcade Donkey Kong's events in the movie canon. Massive water pipe bursts in Brooklyn, they use this opportunity to save it with their plumbing expertise. Pipe leading to a pressure valve breaks, they crash into a wall that carves out an 8-bit Mario head, pretty cool. Then they find a deeper part of Brooklyn's sewer and pipe system, actually called 1-2, Ender Underground, as an underground level remix plays a little bit. It's cool stuff as always. The pipe leading to the Mushroom Kingdoms down there, that's how they get there and how Luigi separates into the Dark Land. Mario 3 Nod calling that land the Dark Land. Any segment, scene, or clip that played before the movie came out, like in trailers or sneak peeks, that's stuff I already made videos on, like the Mushroom Kingdom clip, Town Venture, as well as the trailer stuff, so I'm gonna skimp over most of stuff like that. Brand balls from New Super Mario Bros. Wii and Bitty Buds from Super Mario 3D Land and World roaming about neutrally. You love to see it as the Captain Toad theme gets remixed here. Screw it, I'm gonna bring this up here. Oh my god, the soundtrack is wild with how many songs get referenced. Again, 130, 130 at least, but listing off just off the top of my head. Every single song and jingle for a Mario 1. Songs from Super Mario Bros. 3, the main theme, athletic theme, airship theme, the Super Mario World, the main theme, the athletic theme, ghost house and castle theme, etc. Super Mario 64, the main theme and inside the castle walls sprinkled in there. New Super Mario Bros. P-Switch jingle and Boz. New Super Mario Bros. Wii's ghost house and tower themes. Several Mario Galaxy songs between Captain Toad's theme, Gusty Garden Galaxy, Deep Dark Galaxy of all the Galaxy songs during the Darklands portion with Luigi, also, King Bowser when Mario arrives to the town. Some of the credits music from Mario Galaxy as well. Also, Luigi's Mansion music, some motifs from Mario Odyssey's Fossil Falls, and Perone's Plaza in the M Luncheon Kingdom. Mario credits menu music when you select the characters, carts, and courses is used when they're making the carts Super Mario Kart's Rainbow Road when they're on Rainbow Road and it sounds very 
heavenly, angelic, it's gorgeous, Donkey Kong Arcade and Donkey Kong Country Music, Dr. Mario with the chill song even being used, Bowser's Fury outright when Bowser's army's jamming in the castle, Mario Party 1 music with Wario's Battle King, and even bits of music from Paper Mario the Origami King. The soundtrack goes stupid insane! I love how cinematic it is and how seamless it weaves literal hundreds of Mario songs into a movie score this beautifully. They were cooking with that soundtrack. Luigi stumbling in the dark lands, you got that small tinge of Luigi's Mansion with the flashlight. And not swoopers from several Mario games like I thought, but rather the bats from Mario Galaxy are in there instead. That's neat, but Dry Bones hijinks ensues. Dry Bones jump scare, Luigi runs to the fortress where he gets jumped by Shy Guys and Sniffits instead before it cuts back to the Mushroom Kingdom where Mario and Toad try to get to Peach's castle. This whole clip got its own video way back when it was teased, so apply stuff there to here. The pipe confusion thing was cute, also relatable for us Mario players, also plays into Mario trying to master the level and platforming like everything else during this portion and everything after. They make it to Peach's castle, the guard does this thing, princess is in another castle shtick to keep Mario out, haha, ha. but also, wow, did not take for the whole Toad Society as like this ditzy and this dumb as the movie goes on, but it works though. The main Toad distracts them, Peach having that conference to plan to convince the Kong army to assist them against Bowser. Mario meeting Peach and her shoulder throwing him is hilarious. But like every Mario and Peach interaction, I ate up so hard. I wish we got more time between them, and I really like this movie setting their friendship off the way it did. A lot of this movie's faults or parts can really be boiled down to, man, I wish we got more of that. This is also one of those moments where it's light, but she is mad bubbly and excited over meeting Mario mainly because he's human like her, and her honking his nose, playing with his hat, both her and Mario's expressions just, ah, so cute, so cute and so good. Eager to tag along to save Luigi, Mario persists on going with her. Platforming course. I predicted this portion of the movie would be where we get our introduction to the power-ups, as well as specifically the Super Mushroom that I was predicted after the final teaser given how Mario's height is comparable to Peach there in promo stuff, but everywhere else, he's shorter. And I called it. I called it. Mario hating mushroom joke. Cute. Funny. Also, do not recommend telling the princess of the kingdom of mushrooms that you don't like mushrooms, I'm just saying. Granted, that balances out with Peach calling him not important later on, mainly as a gag, and when they're strapped for time to try to leave for the Kong Island. Montage of Mario messing up, face planting a brick block instead of hitting it with a fist, funny, plenty of fails, a lot of this being relatable to the average Mario enjoyer, almost everyone watching the film, and Mario eventually almost getting there in a single night, him running with his arms out like in Mario 3 and World as well, plus Peach floating down like her float in 3D World and other games, cool stuff, but also heartwarming with Peach trying to make him feel better and acknowledging how close he got, the progress of it all, the entire training bit was just so freaking good dude. Easy one of my favorite parts of the movie. Rave at Bowser's castle, Bowser's fury roaring was cool, every enemy looks awesome in this movie, the Koopas, Goombas, Spinies, Piranha Plants, Shy Guy, Sniff, it's all of them. They all look so good. Conquest mode plan plus to make Peach marry him in a fairy tale wedding. Mario Odyssey style, I love that they did that. The gag of the Koopa getting flamed by Bowser and melted into a dry bones, that was a very funny gag. And I also like how Shy Guys and Bowser for at least three times throughout the movie, they use these same exact voice clips as they have in the games here and there. It's neat little stuff. But also, a flashback sequence showing baby Mario and baby Luigi was something I did not expect at all. All it did was show how since they were babies, nothing could hurt them as long as they're together. The brotherly bond, family. But that was a cool touch and a cute flashback. Oh, it was so adorable. Everyone had some design tweak or adjustment to match hyper-realism mixed with the cartooniness of it all. The baby Mario characters look exactly like their game counterparts, and that was adorable. Peach remarking how the main toads brave and eager for adventure unlike most other toads. I like how they make this main toad stand out from the others like that, as well as how Keegan-Michael Key brings life to this character really well. Peach allowing him and Mario to tag along also felt like it, to me, I kind of registered that as a, a need all the help you can get type of thing, so I don't find it that weird. Peach immediately accepts Mario and Toad's support, but it is another one of those cases where most conversations between characters last three to four lines at best, could have used a little more, maybe like an extra one to three lines. 
a legitimate conversation, basically. Montage of them skimping past Bob on Battlefield, Toast Arena, the Cheap Cheap Bridge, and Yoshi's Island once again. Mario 64, Odyssey, Mario 1, and Yoshi's Island. I wish we got more of them going through these landmarks than just a short montage. Ah, I wish we got more of this movie in general. Bowser rocking the piano something I didn't know I needed. That's cool. Ludwig von Koopa piano, no less. But the Peaches segment was hilarious. I love we're in a world where a song like Peaches, a song from a Mario movie, could actually be eligible to win an Oscar. No, 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 that's so funny. That is so funny. That is unbelievably funny if it does. I would love to see that. The Mario movie winning an Oscar at all? Forget nomination for one. Absolutely funny. That, and, and like, it's, that, that, it's kind of realistic, dude. That would actually be realistic to happen. I'm there for it if it wins. Peach is better win an Oscar. I, oh, I mean, <laughs> I, I'm showing up to the I'm showing up to the Oscars for that man. This is so good. Kamek breaking his zone, both jamming, Bowser playing the underground level, and Kamek injecting some coin sounds, the power up get sound, and the one up sound on the piano too. Also, Kamek in general is just really good in this movie. He's such a good wingman and hype man for Bowser. Kamek's great. He, he he's good. Fire flower field scene. Fire Peach is still super pretty and cool. I find it surreally messed up though. We get Fire Peach and especially Fire Donkey Kong, but no Fire Mario at all in this movie. Weird, kind of messed up. And another flashback scene with Baby Peach and how Peach doesn't know where she's actually from. She could be from Mario's world, but there's a huge universe out there with a lot of galaxies, but how she grew up in the Mushroom Kingdom and became princess. It's super cute and interesting. Again, that's sequel bait. But the baby Mario characters also look so cute. They look so cute, he's so precious. Luigi dungeon with Luma Lee. They don't do anything narratively crazy with Luma Lee. That threw me off for a little bit. Again, probably more sequel bait, but the Luma Lee, all he's there in this movie for is just being a nihilist. That's literally it. It's funny, and it plays into the purpose of Luma's dying into planets, comets, and such, like in Galaxy, but still interestingly weird. That's all they did with a Luma character. And I also gotta love, though, how this movie plays in the- that characters are out for blood, bro. They're trying to kill people in this movie. The first line is literally, open the gates or die from Bowser. Bowser constantly trying to kill Mario. No beating around the bush for that. Same for Donkey Kong fighting Mario. The blue Koopa during the Mario Kart section. The entire Lumilee's contribution. Being a nihilist talking about the sweet relief of death. Like, wow. But also, keep doing that. <laughs> That's neat and cool, and it gives that little tinge of Mario being a little bit more serious and less kids. Like, go for it. Why not? And Charlie Day is such a good fit for Luigi. I'd love more Charlie Day, Luigi. Plus, if there's any main character that got scuffed the most, it's definitely Luigi for largely just being the guy for Mario to save. It gets the job done, but we all know Luigi's capable of much more. It makes sense, but I feel like Luigi could have been done a little more than what they did do with him. Kong Island, the cart segment's funny and fine, and then there's Swanky! He's dead. <laughs> they bring back Swanky just to kill him. Glider from Mario Kart 7's there. Awesome, they get to Cranky's Temple. I like how the guards hold hammers that look like the arcade Donkey Kong hammers, and the mural behind the throne mimics the sprite from arcade Donkey Kong where DK's about to chuck a barrel. Mario's task to fight Donkey Kong, putting the DK rap on to introduce DK is genius and fun. Absolutely screwed up though, the movie does not credit Grant Kirkhope at all during the credits for that song. Super messed up, did not like that, but the rap being there at all is still cool. Donkey Kong's very fun, the fight was very fun too. Diddy Kong, Dixie Kong, and Chunky Kong hyping up DK with the rest of the audience was a great little touch. Diddy also using the bongos from Donkey Kong Jungle Beat. You got DK using his roll move from Donkey Kong Country as well, Mario about to grab a fire flower, but he blows it out just like he can blow out flowers in Donkey Kong Country Returns. His DK punch and the fight also plays with Mario using the mini mushroom from New Super Mario Bros. That was a really cool twist and easy laugh for gags, but it's still a cool way for them adding more modern power-ups into the mix. The dazed eats a me! That was funny. And the cat power-up from 3D World being his end all to win the fight was I think it was probably cooler than I was expecting it to be. He lands like good punches here and there. 
The cat-like reflexes fast dodges, him latching on to and shucking a barrel back at Donkey Kong, like how you could knock the soccer balls back at Bowser in the two fights against him in 3D World. Though I don't think it was as direct of a reference, but it did remind me of that part. And Mario winning the fight on using the pounce move from the same game, and DK almost falling to a slow melody of the startup levels from Donkey Kong as well. All of this fight, it was just very fun and clever stuff. Plus, Seth Rogen laughing out of DK's mouth gets me every time. That laugh should not work as well, nor be as funny as it is, because it's Seth Rogen's laugh, plus Donkey Kong, but ignoring the meme status behind both, it just is, bro. That shit gets me every time. <laughs> Mario being persistent in taking a beating, getting back up, playing into the stubbornness of his character and the theme, like the games of not giving up is good, but DK unable to hold a L is hilarious. My man's is such a filthy mid-level smasher like me, bro. They plan on taking a shortcut to the Mushroom Kingdom to cut Bowser off, and they need carts. The whole Mario Kart segment on Rainbow Road comes after, but the menu music for Mario Kart 8 blaring as they're building their carts had me bopping my head the entire time, and I like how designing their carts has the same structure like the menus for making your carts in Mario Kart 7 and 8. Then it cuts to Bowser practicing his pickup lines for the wedding in his wedding hat from Odyssey. The movie doing the wedding stuff from Odyssey especially and using his and Peach's wedding attire. That is so cool. And Kamek being awesome as usual, playing into this role play, dressing up as Peach for laughs, as well as referencing new Super Mario Bros. Wii where he fakes out the Bowser defeat with this getup too in that game. It's clever and funny stuff as always. Then the Rainbow Road stuff, glorious, beautiful, Mario drifting to get mini turbo boosts here and later on are touches that are just the right amount of extra. And the entire action segment with all the items tossed by Bowser's army and the Kongs, bananas, green shells, bob bombs bullet bills, etc., and the road getting destroyed. Mario also drifting and going off-road like the shortcuts from both Mario Kart 64 and 8's respective Rainbow Roads. Again, it's just constant clever nods. Mario stomping on some of the Koopas, and him on DK's cart next to him alongside Toad and Peach on hers, giving me a little Mario Kart Double Dash vibes, eventually leading to the blue Koopas cart blowing up only for him to walk out of that explosion and do what all of us wanted him to do, chase him down in the blue shell and blow up. It's the kind of thing you know is going to happen, but you want it to. Getting blue shell in Mario Kart's the one thing everyone can relate to. It's really cool. It breaks the road and leaves all the Kongs stuck, with DK Mario falling in the ocean and swallowed by a giant eel. The eel from Mario 64 using the Odyssey redesign. Peach and Toad rush back to the kingdom. Bowser comes, her using the halberd. I am fairly sure that halberd is meant to be the same axe for Mario 1. You chop the bridge off and beat Bowser. Kamek hurts Toad, uses that to convince Peach to marry Bowser. Bowser's gonna sacrifice all the prisoners during the wedding. Mario and DK have a really short moment in the eel's stomach. That's another one of those short dynamics that could be fleshed out for longer, but it's still a fun moment. Mario and DK's dynamic throughout the movie again is mad fun. They escape smashing the insides and flying on a rocket barrel from the cart. Flying like the rocket barrel levels from Donkey Kong Country Returns and Tropical Freeze. And really, since the rainbow stuff happens, like all the Rainbow Road stuff, when that takes place, I think from there on out to the end of the movie, it's the strongest portion. The whole third act of the movie is insanely good. So the wedding starts, and me and my friends are hollering at King Boo and King Bob bomb appearing in the movie. Them sticking with the Mario Kart design for King Boo's a little scuffed, but both characters in the movie, that's still a cool thing they did not have to do, but they did anyways. Peach rocking the wedding dress, and Peach punching Kimmick out of nowhere. It was funny, but Toad helped her hide an ice flower in her bouquet, and the wedding dress turns from blue to white, and ice peach, like, this is the most fun Peach has been in a long ass time. Oh, I am there for this. Peach was hyped from start to finish, and the ice flower is a little frosted too. She's wrecking the entire reception on her own long enough for Mario and DK to make it there. Like, this is unironically cool fun. And then we get the final trailer tease with Fire Donkey Kong and Super Mario trouncing through Bowser's army in the kingdom, platforming, jumping, DK doing the same in the foreground like in Donkey Kong Country, Mario ground pounding like in the mainline game since 64, spin jumping on mushrooms like the spin jumps in 64 Odyssey on the flowers, or New Super Mario Brothers with the spinning platforms, grabs a super leaf, goes to Nuki Mario, and literally flies like he's Tails, which is a funny parallel, but that is what the two Nuki suit and raccoon power do in Mario 3. King Babam blows up Pete from Peach 
which knocks her back. But can we talk about how there are also three suicide bombings in this movie? <laughs> Swanky Kong, Blue Koopa, and King ba -Bomb. All my mans left a little too quickly in this movie. DK stops the gears from dropping the prisoners in the lava. Mario saves Lou. He calls him Lou, and their little brotherly moment was precious. Bowser launches the bonsai bill, and Mario manages to get its attention by tail attacking it in the eye like in Mario 3, and it flies through the mushroom planes to the pipe Mario came from, and it explodes in the warp zone, pulling the castle and everyone in like a tide pulling you out to the sea. Pulling Mario and the castle and everyone back to Brooklyn, the final fight taking place back in Brooklyn was a nice twist. The superstar lands, but Bowser kind of thrashes the hell out of Mario here. He's all bruised up, banged up, hiding out in the Punch-Out Pizzeria. The others are holding him off, but Mario's losing hope, doubting himself, like the tiny little character stuff and how he's emoting here. Stuff like that, show don't tell, it's really slight and all throughout this movie, but it's so good and something they don't do often in Mario games, especially for Mario himself. I love that so much. The man don't quit, just like us playing his games, dying to that Goomba, failing that jump, Peach knocks the star near Mario with a shell, Mario jumps toward it as Bowser flame breathes towards him, and Luigi stops it with a manhole cover. Foreshadow from the mirror, the Mario Brothers are strong and capable as long as they're together, the flashback stuff, the beginning of the film, it's good, it's good. And Mario brings Luigi with them to the star, they're glowing rainbow colors, the star themes blaring in a cinematic way. It's kinda cheesy, but moments like this made me remember, man, I love this franchise so much. The Starman remix went super hard, they're plowing through the entire army with ease, it looks awesome, then they're running with their hands out like Mario 3 and World or when they get the Rainbow Star in the Galaxy games. Then, their hands behind them, exactly like how they run in the new Super Mario Bros. series. Then they're clocking Bowser left and right, throwing him from the tail like in Mario 64, forward airing him like Mario and Smash Bros. stomping him, and I don't think there was a flat out Mario and Luigi reference in the film. You might as well could call this team up with the Star or Bros. attack from Mario and Luigi, because that's a Mario and Luigi type of thing. That's my headcanon anyways, it's still fun. Bowser's beaten, Peach feeds him a mini mushroom, fun gag. Of course, Toad stuffs him in the jar. Of course, it's it's the freaking jar. The jar. And everyone cheers. Spike is a fake-ass fan. You're not fooling me. Fake-ass fan? Fake-ass fan. Fake-ass fan. Their parents are astounded. The Super Mario Brothers. Super Mario Brothers. Cute, happy ending. Mario and Luigi are now living in the Mushroom Kingdom. But I can imagine their job's gonna extend between the Mushroom Kingdom and Brooklyn. Movie ends, colorful credits roll, wonderful medley of songs across the Mario series plays, Bowser's Tiny in a Cage at Peach's Castle, funny gag, as well as sequel bait, and another sequel bait, the second post credit scene, a Yoshi egg cracks in Brooklyn sewers. Don't get me wrong, this is kind of cool in its own way. It's Yoshi. Yoshi's super popular and a cool character and all that stuff, but like, they skimped over Yoshi's Island in this movie. So I feel like this kind of doesn't largely work the way it's intended because of that. Still, Yoshi teasing a sequel from this, ignoring all the other sequel baits and the money this movie's making. It's neat regardless. It is underwhelming though, I'm not gonna lie. Spoiler territory is covered and all in all, yeah, it's not the most cinematically gifted film in any way. But yeah, no, easy film of the year for me. Easily one of my favorite films ever. It's basically everything I could have ever wanted a Mario movie to do. It is held back by fast pacing, not fully making the most of its backstory and character stuff, as well as everything it does as a film is nothing new or anything other movies haven't said or done. But it's a solid family film as well as a remarkable Mario film. It's incredibly colorful, masterfully animated, visually stunning, masterfully composed, Wonderful soundtrack, great sound design, great character design, solid writing, solid comedy, solid narrative composition overall, great character moments that were there for Mario fans, perfect theming and narrative context that matches the games in several ways perfectly, an unbelievable roller coaster of easter eggs and nods to hundreds of different Mario games on several layers, and an incredibly fun, entertaining, and genuine time that's just as fun, replayable, passionate and entertaining as the plethora of Mario games within a series. Normal film standards, 7 out of 10, B-. minus. Mario film standards, Mario standards, easiest A of my life, easiest 9 out of 10. Such a fun and great film all in all. Easy A. So fun. I love this movie so much, man. Super looking forward to more Mario movie sequels and spinoffs, more Nintendo movies in general. 
Thank you very much for listening and watching. And I got plenty more Mario movie content coming into this next month. Look out for that. Look out for other Mario content in general. And stay super.